Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the ARPA Institute uh, lecture series. And I thank you for joining us on this Saturday. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the presentation. For those of you who are not familiar with the ARPA Institute, ARPA has been working in Armenia since 1992. And our main goal is to provide technical expert guidance and, and advice to advance technology, science, health, education, and various other fields. Our members are essentially experts from various fields. And all we do is work for Armenia uh, in our spare time. And we try to improve the situation both in science, technology, and all these other fields. We have uh, several programs that uh, are impl implemented in Armenia. Uh, one of them is an invention competition for young scientists to improve and to, to encourage young scientists to develop new products for Armenia and for the world. We also have a distance learning program where we find experts and then they speak online uh, with, with the internet and we connect with the students and professors in Armenia. The main uh, reason is to provide the newest the most advanced technologies that are available currently. We also have uh, a new a couple of new programs or three programs. One of them is to establish science fairs in all schools of Armenia. We had already planned to do that last year, but unfortunately, because of the corona, we had to cancel it. And so we're hoping that we'll do it next year. And um, we're working with, of course, the government of Armenia, and to the spe specifically the Ministry of Science, Education, Culture, and Sports. We also work with the universities and uh, Academy of Sciences, various institutes. We provide them with uh, scientific instrumentation, uh, expertise, guidance, and even financial assistance. We also have programs for the, uh, to start small businesses in the border regions of Armenia to encourage the people in these villages to create their own businesses, to, to have income and stay in the village and not travel anywhere else. We also, of course, have this presentation series once or twice a month um, on topics related to Armenia or Armenians in general. And uh, we get, uh, we, we record all the presentations and put it on YouTube. So even if you weren't able to attend, you can still watch it on YouTube. And we send the invitations or the announcements via email. So if you have anybody that would like to participate and uh, we don't have their emails, please forward it to us, put it on the chat, uh, chat room here and we'll uh, make sure that they get the announcements next time. So um, that is all about ARPA Institute. We have a board of directors for 15 people that uh, organize all the activities and, and these events. So we are today fortunate and thankful to Dr. Jonathan Conlin for uh, taking the time and uh, presenting this, uh, what will be a very interesting presentation. Dr. Dr. Conlin was born and raised in New York and he studied history at Oxford, Cambridge, and London universities. He's now a senior lecturer in history at the University of Southampton since, now, since 2006. His books include a biography of Adam Smith and a comparative history of Paris and London. His biography of Gilbenkian, Mr. 5%, has been translated into Armenian, Turkish, Russian, and Portuguese. We're glad to have you, Dr. Uh, Conlin. 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. And can you, Hagop, can you see that? Yes, yes. Excellent. Well, if uh, I'm speaking from England, where it's about just after uh, 8 p.m., and fortunately, if anything goes wrong with the signal, I'm very grateful to Hagop and Jora, not only for inviting me, but for arranging to call me if suddenly we get cut off and I'm speaking to nobody. I'm delighted to, to speak in this uh, detached manner. I'm only sorry I wasn't able to speak to you in person last year when in, in April I did a book tour for Mr. 5% and visited Fresno, Glendale, and Los Angeles. But I gather that this forum is not only catering to residents of the Southern California, but indeed has people from throughout the world. So I'm very all the more delighted to be able to speak to such a, a wide audience. And I particularly appreciate everyone making the time at what I'm sure is, is a very worrying time in view of the current situation in Armenia. But to our topic, our topic, Mr. Gulbenkian, I wanted to start with a episode in his life, which I think sums up the very complicated set of, of loyalties and identities that Gulbenkian had, and which made him such a challenging topic for a biographer. So our scene opens therefore on Monday, the 31st of October, 1927, when Kalus Gulbenkian attended a dinner in honor of King Faisal of Iraq at the home of Sir John Cadman in London. The mood was festive two weeks before at Baba Gurgur near Kirkuk in northern Iraq, a Turkish petroleum company drilling team had struck oil. As chairman of the company, it fell to Cadman to toast the happy discovery. Unfortunately for him, not everyone there spoke English. Cadman would have to deliver his speech in French, a language he did not speak. Like any time poor businessman, he found a high tech solution. French lessons on phonograph records, which he listened to in his bathtub. To quote his speech, there are three reasons for which I and my colleagues are happy this evening. The first reason, it is the first time that four nations, oh, pardon me, five nations and Mr. Gulbenkian, who represents all the nations, are sitting at the same table in true and close friendship. The four nations Cadman was referring to were the four major groups, each of whom held 23.75% of Turkish Petroleum Company, TPC. Companies based in Britain, Holland, France, and the United States. In a slightly comic gesture, Cadman leaves out the newest nation, Iraq, a kingdom established by Britain under League of Nations mandate in 1921. Cadman quickly catch, catches his mistake. But what about Gulbenkian? In 1927, Gulbenkian was a British citizen, a French resident, and an Iranian diplomat. He also held Ottoman and Armenian passports. But each of these connections was somewhat loose. Gulbenkian never visited Iran. He had not been to Turkey for almost 30 years, and he no longer lived in the United Kingdom either. Four months after this dinner party, the British authorities noticed his absence and considered revoking his naturalization. Fortunately, the British Home Office consulted Cadman, who warned that Gulbenkian would create untold trouble if they stripped him of his British citizenship. For Cadman to state that Gulbenkian represents all the nations was a flattering way of saying that Gulbenkian was a citizen of the world, a nowhere man. Gulbenkian's response to Cadman's remarks is not recorded, but we do know that he disliked being called an oil man. He preferred to see himself as a business architect and took great pride in the international cartels he created. TPC, after all, saw former rivals collaborate across the Middle East, transforming a threat to the world oil cartel into an opportunity. Having brought in the French, then the Americans, Gulbenkian hoped to bring the Iraqis into the tent 
to make the Iraqi state or Iraqi investors a sixth group within TPC. It was not to be, and we are still living with the consequences in the Middle East, born of the people's frustration at the company's slowness in bringing their oil on stream. Then there was Royal Dutch Shell, the world's first truly global oil company, which Gulbenkian created together with the Dutchman, Henri Deterding. The gulbenkian dating relationship was remarkably intimate. Each confided in the other more than they did with their own wives. They knew that they're very different talents. Dating was a very um, outspoken, feverishly diligent and active man, known for bouts of temper, whereas Gulbenkian was a much softer, softly spoken diplomat. Each, in a sense, therefore, complemented the other. After their breakup in 1925, which was caused Gulbenkian great pain, Gulbenkian hoped that he could shape his errant son, Nubar, into a fitting replacement, a project doomed to failure. But Royal Dutch Shell, with stock market listings in Amsterdam, London, New York, and Paris, lived on, a company skilled at striking nationalist poses in the pursuit of its own profit presenting itself as patriotically British or French or Dutch, depending on the situation. To be a citizen of nowhere could be very profitable, therefore, as well as very exciting. Gulbenkian's lack of a clear allegiance, or rather the ease with which he carried off so many different allegiances, was the key to his success as a business architect. Born into a wealthy Armenian Ottoman family who numbered among the Amira elite, as a Gulbenkian, Kalus was well positioned to assume this role. The Amira class, the merchant elite, were educated, polyglot, and mobile. Boys were sent to explore new opportunities in foreign ports at an age which today strikes us as cruelly young. Certainly cruelly young in the case of Kalust, a shy boy who clung to his mother. Kalust's father, Sarkis, instilled a fearsome work ethic in his teenage son teaching him to enjoy hard work for its own sake, rather than as a means to wealth or parental approval. Home for the Gubankians was a distant village in central Anatolia, Talas, a place to come from, never a place to go. Although sacrilegious in one sense, in another, it is entirely fitting that Gubankians' ancestral home is now a boutique hotel. Family gravestones recovered from the rubble of the Armenian cemetery have been repurposed as decoration for the hotel's bar. On-trend authenticity for high-end tourists, a more faithful vision of globalized modernity than the shiny glass Sheratons down the road in the city of Kayseri. Home as a design accent. A century on, the rest of us have finally caught up with the Gulbenkians. Or at least I used to think so. In 2015 in Istanbul, I concluded a conference paper on the Gulbenkians by noting just how far the Amira anticipated our globalized world. As I put it then, we are all Amira now. By the time the paper was published, just two years later, that statement appeared quaint. Globalization had gone into reverse. Quote, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere, asserted British Prime Minister Theresa May in her 2016 party conference speech. May's contrast between international elites, bad, and the people down the road, good, captured a mood of atavistic populism which has since swept the world. And I don't need to tell those of you sitting in the United States anything about that. In July, Turkey was rocked by Erdogan's coup in reverse. So perhaps the period between 1989 and 2001 was nothing but an interlude in history with a capital H of national interest realpolitik, a short-lived return to that free trading, freewheeling world Gulbenkian grew up in in the late 19th century. In 19, January 1934, Gulbenkian boarded a cruise ship in Naples, setting out on the fifth 
of that series of holidays he began taking in 1928. This trip would take in Cairo, the Nile, Jerusalem, Damascus, and Beirut. In the case of a Stakhanovite like Gulbenkian, seeing the sights was neither leisurely nor relaxing. Typed in French and bound in matching ring binders, complete with a table of contents and even indexes, Gulbenkian's travel diaries appear equally cheerless. The word holiday in Gulbenkian's case should probably be placed in scare quotes. It was landscape which most interested Gulbenkian the tourists, which elicits the nearest thing in the diaries to personal commentary. I had heard so much about the beauty of Beirut's surroundings, he wrote in his diary, that he decided to rise the following morning and take an excursion to Ashrafia Hill. This was the same hill his party had driven down on their way into Beirut the previous day. 13th of February, in the morning I came back to the hill to see the view of the surrounding mountains, which resemble the environs of Cannes. It's very pretty, but not extraordinary, you might be in Esterel, outside Cannes. Beirut is a town like Algiers, a swarming little Marseille with a pretty corniche. I visited an Armenian village, very poor. Around 11 a.m. we left Beirut by the coast road, once again by car heading for Haifa. Gulbenkian's secretary took a few portraits, photographs of Gulbenkian chatting to Armenian children. Such casual holiday snaps are precious. Gulbenkian seldom allowed himself to be photographed, even by members of his close family or entourage, which on this case included a French doctor. Gulbenkian was a great hypochondriac and had a doctor with him at all times, and a secretary, but no family members. Above one photograph, this one, you can see a secretary has added a mysterious phrase, Beirut, vous, and then the letter C. Perhaps vous êtes con, roughly translatable as you rude boys or you rascals. The more one learns about the history of this Armenian village, the more laconic Gulbenkian's diary entry appears. These children were refugees, born into the camps established on the outskirts of Beirut in the wake of the Armenian genocide. By 1922, there were more than 15,000 such Armenian refugees around Beirut. The neighborhood Gulbenkian encountered was one of the set of settlements established for these refugees after 1927. Some of them named after the towns these refugees had been evicted from, hence Nor Adana, as in New Adana. Others after wealthy diaspora Armenians who had paid to build them, hence Gulabashen, named after Gulbenkian's cousin Gulabi. As president of the Armenian General Benevolent Union from 1930 to 1932, Gulbenkian had close personal experience of the politics of Armenian migration and repatriation to Soviet Armenia. He had given money to support Armenian refugees, just as he had given money to fund the completion of a new library at the Armenian Patriarchate in Jerusalem. Yet Kalust paid his library in Jerusalem the briefest of visits at 10 p.m. of night and apparently had no desire to visit Gulab Hashem at all. This encounter, therefore, with poor Armenian refugees, some of whom are barefoot, seems to be entirely unplanned and unscripted. Gulbenkin was driven up a hill to admire the view and bumped into fellow Armenian refugees from Anatolia living in hastily erected houses wrapped in sheets of tar paper. What was going through Gulbenkian's mind as he encountered these fellow Armenians, fellow exiles from our Anatolia? Did they speak to each other in Armenian, Turkish, or as the caption would suggest, French? Did the children recognize the strange foreigner in the flat cap as one of their own, or simply as a rich alien visitor with his own car? someone to be gawped at. His hands behind his back tilted forwards, Gulbenkian's you rude boys, if that's what he's in fact saying, is probably intended to be playful. But the boys and the French doctor seem more at ease at being photographed than Gulbenkian. 
Certainly, he seems a bit ill at ease in the photograph on the right. Four photographs nonetheless made it into Gulbenkian's travel diary, suggesting that despite the surprisingly short diary entry I quoted, Gulbenkian wanted to remember this encounter. A salutary reminder that for many millions, mobility is not a question of opportunity and adventure, but escape and impoverishment. Gulbenkian himself is unlikely to have seen himself as a refugee. For his son, Nubar, writing in the 1960s in his autobiography, however, it was pleasant to rewrite family history as a history of escape from Istanbul. Nubar claimed that his family had narrowly escaped the genocidal anti-Armenian violence unleashed in the city by Sultan Abdul Hamid in 1896 after Papken Sunni's and the Dashnak's attack on Ottoman Bank. Nubar's version of events has it the family left Istanbul in such a hurry that they left their washing behind. Seen from today's perspective, such stories help make Gulbenkian appear to participate in a shared experience of violent persecution and flight, which has become central to Armenian identity. And yet, closer examination reveals a more complex story. On researching this episode more, more narrowly, I found that the Gulbenkian's flight from Istanbul in 1896 was not quite as hurried as Nubar recalled. While the family was certainly escaping the Sultan, they were also escaping death threats and extortion from Tashnaks, that is, from fellow Ottoman Armenians, who saw the Gulbenkian and the Amira as collaborators with the Sultan. These Tashnak revolutionaries were ready to die for the Armenian nation. Gulbenkian found armed conflict something ridiculous and forbid Nubar and later his grandson from serving in uniform. Writing to Nubar from his suite at the Ritz in Paris in 1918 during the First World War, he broke off to complain in the margin about the barbaric and stupid sound of the German supergun Big Bertha, then shelling Paris. While other Amira sent their boys to fight in the French army, Nubar, as I've said, was banned from going. In the Second World War, that ban was still in place. Kalus expected his grandson, Mikhail, to take Iranian nationality so that he would not be called up. Mikhail refused to comply and served for three years in the Royal, Ar Royal Artillery in the British Armed Forces. And his mother, Rita, backed him up. To quote a letter she wrote to her father, the outcome of this war is vital not only for mankind, but for our personal and material interests. I say our when I mean your. It's about your return, your house, your belongings, your material and moral comfort. I don't see why other mummies and daddies, little Mikhail's, just as precious to them as Mikhail is to us, should sacrifice themselves for you and for him. What Rita was challenging here was her father's view that somehow, perhaps as an Ottoman Armenian belonging to a nation that had become a Soviet um, puppet state by this point, perhaps also as a very wealthy man, a man in the inter international oil industry, that he could somehow avoid war and leave the fighting and the damage to others. Rita herself did not agree with this and helped smuggle British airmen back across the channel from France to England. When her son expressed pride in what she was doing, Caloust added this to the numbered list of his grandson's 14 faults, neatly typed on the note paper of the Hotel of Iche in Lisbon, where he spent the last years of his life and where he hid out during World War II. Mikhail's pride in his mother's service showed, quote, unwarranted pride and misplaced loyalty. As Rita noted, Lisbon during World War II was a pleasant refuge a place to stay while waiting until return to France became possible. Avenue Diena, the building at number 51, was the closest thing Gulbenkian ever had to a home. Reconstructed around a core of iron girders, the building was, in Gulbenkian's words, built like a battleship. Perhaps it was more of a fortress in that it was notoriously difficult 
to actually see the inside of it. I was able to visit the house a few days before it passed out of the Gulbenkian Foundation's hands in 2015. As with the Gulbenkian's house in Talas, the sense of an imminent snapping of the final frayed threads tying these places to my subject lent this building and this visit an added plangency. But it was in Les Enclos near Deauville, now the Parc Calus Gulbenkian, where I felt closest to Mr. Five Percent. And if you are in Normandy in the months of July and August, the two months that it's open to the public, I warmly recommend a visit. Acquired in 1927, the estate of Les Enclos represents Gulbenkian's attempt to construct a refuge for himself and his birds, for whom he constructed a village of miniature Norman castles, now partly ruined and sadly off limits to most visitors. Here you can see the architect Duchenne's plans for, I think that's for the pheasant house. And there on the left, you can see a picture of, of me inside one of them. And you can see how they really are miniature. I mean, they're designed to look as if they're full size Norman style chateaus or, or Norman style, I suppose, traditional buildings, but they're, they're on the birds, bird scale as it were. So it's kind of like a Disney village intended only for the happiness of uh, pheasants, swans, and ducks. It was here alone that Gulbenkian could adopt that philosopher of pose of which he was so fond. He encouraged his grandson Mikhail to become a close friend of nature. As he wrote, for to enjoy a kind of intimacy with nature is to possess a source of profound satisfaction in life. For the man with insight into her secrets, nature becomes a kind refuge. Although Gulbenkian never cited Voltaire's famous line himself, the final sentence of Candide does spring to mind here, il faut cultiver notre jardin, we must cultivate our garden. And Les Enclos certainly was cultivated. Gulbenkian took great care over every aspect of the landscape, carrying out regular site inspections whenever he could. Had Gulbenkian been in Normandy on the morning of Tuesday, the 6th of June, 1942, instead of, uh, instead of at the Hotel of Viche, he might have spotted a large ship on the horizon. Laid down in 1912, HMS Warspite was a Queen Elizabeth class battleship, one of the first battleships to be designed for oil power. Unfortunately, the ship began firing its 15 inch guns at the German battery immediately west of Les Enclos. Shells overshot their target, striking and uprooting specimen conifers and rare trees, disturbing Gulbenkian's carefully thought out mise-en-scene. It was D-Day. Without warning, Gulbenkian's peaceful refuge became backdrop to history with a vengeance, liberated and at the same time destroyed by oil power. It would be hard to imagine a more ironic comeuppance for a man used to finding away around and through armed conflict. Gulbenkian's final years in Lisbon were marked by indecision and apathy. Gulbenkian first proposed to leave Vichy and visit Portugal to have a change in May 1941, only to change his mind when the Spanish invasion of Portugal began to look likely. When he did travel to, to Lisbon in 1942, he and his entourage were on their way to the United States. That trip too, however, was canceled when the British tax authorities forwarded his name to the Inland Reven Internal Revenue Service in the United States. Gulbenkian, having his own international spy network, heard that, they were, that the IRS were going to be welcoming him at New York with open arms and a, a very thorough tax audit. So he decided to cancel his trip to America and remain in Lisbon, where he was not subjected to the attentions of the tax authorities to the same degree. So when peace finally broke out in 1945, Gulbenkian became preoccupied with rather some, uh, his own Second World War, as his son Nubar called it, a three year long battle with his partners within TPC, 
that lasted from 1945 to 1948. Basically, what happened in brief was that Gulbenkian's partner, especially the Americans inside TPC, tried to argue that Gulbenkian's presence in Vichy and later in neutral Portugal meant that he was an enemy agent and therefore should not be paid the proceeds of his 5% of Middle East oil production. Thereafter, fears that the Korean War might trigger World War III once again set Gulbenkian thinking of moving on, perhaps to Mexico. As the US diplomat David Bruce put it at the time, Gulbenkian was, quote, poised to fly anywhere in the world. Plans for Gulbenkian's foundation, therefore, first advanced in the 1930s, advanced very slowly in the 1950s. Gulbenkian's lead financial advisor, Joseph Hengler of Zurich, explored the legal and tax implications of various jurisdictions in which the foundation might have been founded, Canada, the United States, and Panama. It was clear that the question of where to register the future Gulbenkian Foundation and the question of where to spend its money were two distinct questions in Gulbenkian's mind. Once presented with the facts and asked for further instructions, however, Gulbenkian hesitated. He continued to string along his art advisors, including Kenneth Clark, director of London's National Gallery, and John Walker, director of Washington's National Gallery. Hoping to exploit these directors' appetite for his art collection as extra leverage in his battle for a one off tax exemption from death and estate taxes. Bouts of ill health caused few the further delays and fueled Gulbenkian's suspicions of his entourage, including tragically of his own son. Whenever anyone asked him for guidance on his foundation's priorities, Gulbenkian simply replied, leave it to Radcliffe, a reference to Lord Cyril Radcliffe, one of his English lawyers, who he confided in to a degree in which he did not confide in any other of his lawyers. This statement was both a statement of confidence in Radcliffe and of lack of confidence in whoever he said it to. The adjective passive aggressive is one we tend to overuse, but it does seem to hold here. In describing Radcliffe, the uh, in describing to Radcliffe the inconclusive and confusing account of Portuguese tax rules provided by what Gulbenkian called his Portuguese lawyer, José de Azeredo Perdigal, Gulbenkian was appealing for his friend Radcliffe's help. Gulbenkian told Radcliffe he felt single-handed in Lisbon. Radcliffe reminded Gulbenkian of the dangers the foundation would be exposed to as an international philanthropy if any one national interest were to be allowed to dominate. As if Gulbenkian needed reminding, he had been designing finely tuned international consortia all his life. Lacking the requisite energy himself, Gulbenkian hoped that this uncharacteristic pose of helplessness would energize Radcliffe. That trust would prove misplaced. So would Gulbenkian's faith in his son Nubar, in his son-in-law, Kavork, in Charles Wishaw, another lawyer, and in Perdigal, his Portuguese lawyer, none of whom had any experience of running a charity. In March 1951, just four years before his death, Gulbenkian complained to the French poet Alexis Leger of what he called a rather curious psychological state, one almost of apathy, because I do not really have the desire to do anything. This apathy leads me to live on the margin of life and other living things, to neglect all outside contact. As his son-in-law Kavork recalled a few months after Gulbenkian's death, the final 1953 will was like one drafted in 1950, never intended to be final. Quote, Amazingly, no one thought for a moment that there was any hurry, and the old man himself and people like Radcliffe went on as if they had years and years in which to elaborate the testamentary arrangements. Gulbenkian intended to get the foundation going in his lifetime and see it established and functioning before he died. After the 1953 will was signed, Perdigal reassured the Portuguese dictator Salazar in a letter of the 13th of April, 1954, 
that it would be the final will and that the foundation would be secured for Portugal. It was a remarkable assertion for a lawyer to make regarding his client, but it proved prophetic. Gulbenkian in 1953 was a real nowhere man, to borrow John Lennon's term. That relentless focus, Gulbenkian's famous mantra, which he would repeat ceaselessly at business associates and at members of his family of check, check, check. That intuition born of a lifetime's experience in one of the world's most cutthroat industries, all were set aside or thrust aside by ill health. Gulbenkian trusted that it would somehow turn out all right. Nowhere man, don't worry. Take your time, don't hurry. Leave it all till someone else lends you a hand. Doesn't have a point of view, knows not where he's going to. Isn't he a bit like you and me? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Very interesting presentation. For a very complicated person, I guess. So, uh, it's time for questions now. You can put your questions in the chat room and uh, we'll present it one by one. In the meantime, I have a question. I, my, you know, we, we know that um, his relationship with the Armenian community and our, especially the Armenian leadership back then was not very smooth. Could you say a few things about that? Yes, I mean, I, th I think his relationship certainly, he was in the immediate, as, as we all know, immediately at the end of World War I, there was a great hope that the Americans might take a League of Nations mandate for Armenia, for what, what would have been a massive six vilayet uh, Armenia, which would have taken, a, which would have extended from the Black Sea to the Med. Um, at that point, Gulbenkian was, you would have thought would have been able to pull his contacts and be working very hard to make that a reality. After all, he had, was going in and out of the French and the British foreign ministries. He knew the leaders personally. And yet I found very little evidence that he was involved with that. Um, and in a way, his decision to, to become leader of the AGBU in 1930 was quite unusual. I think he probably did that with the idea in mind that he would resign uh, after a, a token amount and let his son Newbar, who he, Newbar spent his whole life failing to find something to do. So the idea was maybe that Newbar would do um, the AGBU as it were. Um, once he was in post though at the AGBU, Gulbenkian obviously had to negotiate with um, the leaders of the Soviet Republic of Armenia and negotiate with them what, um, what I think anyone who's worked on the archives of this would find a very painful and uncomfortable set of negotiations, which almost feel like the buying and selling of refugees because the uh, Soviet authorities, uh, Gabriel Terminas uh, um, at the time, would only accept a certain number of refugees um, in return for money from the AGBU or from other charitable bodies in the West that as it were had hard currency. So Gulbenkian was literally negotiating how much for this number of thousands of refugees to be allowed back. I use the word back advisedly because obviously most of them had never been inside the geographic borders of the Republic of Soviet Republic of Armenia. And I think the reason why he was kicked out uh, just two years after being appointed to the presidency of AGBU was because he was so effective, he was a great negotiator at, at, at um, getting one over the authorities, the Soviet authorities, that they started a, a smear campaign in the press against Gulbenkian, claiming that he, was, um, that he was trying to, for example, settle people not in Armenia, but in Syria to use them as slave labor for building his oil pipeline, which was patently untrue. Um, Gulbenkian, was the sort of person that Armenians would write to him all the time, often claiming to be his cousin. He had lots of cousins, um, which he was always very skeptical about. But they would often write asking for work in one of his oil companies. 
And his response was always, if you're qualified, apply and you'll get the job if you're the right person for the job. But in no way should you think that because you're Armenian and I'm Armenian, that somehow I'm going to give you a job. That kind of sort of door door mentality, which I'm sure he was used to being a very wealthy man. And that sense of, of loyalty, uh, that if you're Armenian, you have to help other Armenians out. He did not feel that at all. So his relationships with the Soviet authorities were very tense. Uh, and fortunately, perhaps after his death, the foundation was able to negotiate for his wishes in respect of reconstructing the Holy Mother Church of Etmiatzin, for example. He gave a lot of money in his will to rebuild that for those wishes to be realized. But in a sense, he was too good a negotiator to have healthy relationship with the Soviet authorities. Thank you. Um, Narek Seferian has a question. Narek, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Hello Narek. Very nice to see you. Very nice to see you, even if we're far away and across a computer. I, I would like to hear more about identity issues. I know there's a lot to say on this point, and you've already touched upon many things. But I'm particularly fond of the Basturma quote by Rita, and I would be happy if you would share that with this audience. And if you could talk about more than uh, Kalus, his, his children, because I feel like his children and his grandchildren did not lead as much um, sort of transnational lives, that perhaps they do have more sound British or French identities. I wonder if you could elaborate on these points a little bit. Thank you. Yes, I should declare Nareg is an is a old friend of mine who, who um, helped with, I have to say, I am a complete Odar. I do not speak Armenian. I can sing the first verse of Bank Ottoman, however, if required. Um, but Nareg was very helpful as a, as a research assistant for, for several months and was very, very helpful. What he's referring to here my is... My privilege, a, my privilege. What he's referring to here with this gnomic reference to Bazdurma was that in another letter, Rita was, his daughter Rita was someone who was, she was a poet and she was a very, very talented writer and was very spot on in... When she, in terms of analyzing her father's character. And um, she called the identity question about, for example, she said every 25 years is another world war and the Gobenkian clan is faced with what she called, it was her phrase, the Bazdurma question. And, I, and then she says, well, what does it mean for us to be Armenians? And what does it mean for you, my father, Kalus, to be Armenians? Um, because I think what she was saying was that Kalus might have been trying to say, well, we as Armenians, we don't have a dog in this fight in World War II, uh, we can sit it out. And what she's saying in that letter, which I quoted as another example, is of saying, well, you can't claim that you're Armenians now, and that's where your loyalty is, when during World War I, if Nubar had wanted to fight for General Antranik, and I saw we have an Antranik in the audience tonight, if, you, if, if, if Nubar had 1914 had said, I want to go and fight with, under General Antranik, the great hero, um, uh, Kalus would have laughed in his face, uh, that, that, that idea, don't be ridiculous, go back to learning about the oil business. Um, so the Pazdurma question was because Pazdurma comes from Kaiseri, and that's where the Gulbenkians came from. But I think she also meant that, that there was something among all this fluidity, there was something perhaps deeply visceral within the Gulbenkians that remained in Talas. Because as we all know, if you eat Bazdama, your breath stinks. You can't go to pretend that you haven't been eating Bazdama and the, the effects are quite lingering. So I think that was very, she caught something there by calling it the Bazdama question. I think all Armenians, I'm sure, so far as I'm aware, observing them from outside, wherever you are in the diaspora, I think you all, everyone has their version of this Bazdama question. But to get to the second part of Nareg's question, the, the two children, uh, the daughter Rita and the son um, Nubar. Nubar becomes almost a, a, a cliche in the way, I mean, I'm, I'm a migrant to Britain from, from America and I've kind of done the same thing. You, you, some migrants to Britain become almost more British than the British. Um, in the case of Nubar, he became a fox hunter. I mean, fox hunting is in the 20th century is already looking a bit old fashioned. 
Um, he was interested in, in sort of horse racing and horse jumping, something again, which his father saw as, as too dangerous and unwise. So yes, although I think, uh, and the same with, with Rita wanting to, she wrote poetry in French. Um, she lived in, in Paris for, for much of her life and her taste was, was quite French. Um, but I think both of them, I think, felt that they'd, that they'd adopted British nationality. And in one of her letters, Rita says, you know, looking around at Newbar and at her father and says, no one would ever look at us and think we're not Armenian. We look Armenian. But um, of all the nations to have as a second nationality, Britain, Britain is, is, you know, pretty good. And they're a pretty good race or people. I think she uses the word people. And I'm happy for my son, Gobenkian's great, great Gubenkian's grandson, Mikhail, to, he went to school uh, at an English boarding school and they had a decision about whether to give him Armenian lessons, whether he should be baptized in the Armenian faith. And they decided not to. I think that was again a very a decision that I'm sure all parents in the diaspora have had to make similar difficult decisions, but they decided it was better that he would be, as it were, a half-hearted Anglican than a ignorant Armenian Orthodox. That's, I think that's another letter from Rita. So yeah, hopefully that illuminates some of, of, of those very complex issues. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Aslanian has a question. He says, what is his wealth now and how many languages did he speak? And also, okay. did he in any way, was, was he in any way a nationalist? And did he help any any way uh, towards for Armenia to become independent? Um, so languages, um, he he had he obviously had Armenian. I think the family probably spoke Turkish. I know that you know today there can be a gasp when one says that, but it was quite common in the Amira class to speak to speak um, Turkish at home. You might speak French when you want to talk about the servants, and they don't so that they don't understand you. We have a lovely in the among the all the papers in in Istanbul, which Nareg and I had the privilege to work on, was was the first love letter that Kalu sends to um, to Navart, his wife, when she's only I think sixteen, and it's a tiny little note that's obviously been folded up into a into a very small letter, and it's a secret note that he's writing to her to arrange to meet the next day to continue their courtship both parents opposed the match. So they were, they were having to meet in secret. And it's written in, and it's written in French. And Calouste, who's then 20, I think, writes, um, you can write a response under this letter and give it to this servant. The servant doesn't speak French. So obviously being able to have multiple languages was, was, very, was very useful. And certainly Calouste's parents would have been used to writing, um, uh, uh, writing in the, um, using a weird combination of Ottoman Turkish uh, vocabulary and Armenian script. This was, as you can imagine, for, for me as a researcher, very challenging because you can get people who, who know Ottoman Turkish, which is already pretty hard to read these days, um, and you can get people who get Armenian, but to get someone who has, you need someone who has both, which is quite a challenge. So we got Turkish, Armenian, English, French, uh, he never learned Portuguese, despite living there for 13 years. I think that reveals also about the extent to which he probably didn't want his foundation to be, uh, to be what it became interpreted as, which was a gift to Portugal, one state, whereas Gulbenkian intended it to be for humanity. And the question of uh, his wealth, he died in 1955, which was two years before the Forbes magazine had its first rich list but I worked out how much he was worth and it's in the last page of my book. And weirdly, I don't actually have a copy of it here, but he would have been, at his death, I worked out he was the richest man in the world. Getty would have overtaken him very rapidly though. So Getty, who's just had a film done about him, would have been, would probably just pipped him to the post. But the foundation, which retained his oil interests until just last year when it sold his oil company, Partex, to the Thais, the people from Thailand, the Thai National Oil Company, was uh, the foundation is sold it off for, I believe, half a billion dollars. Um, so the foundation is the 23rd or richest foundation in the world. So it's not the, it's not the, um, 
the Bill and Melinda Gates foundations by any means, but the Gulbenkian Foundation is still one of the richest foundations in the world. So that hopefully gives you a sense of how much money we're talking about. About his nationalistic feelings and helping Armenia to become independent. Yeah, I mean, many people when I when I give when I've given papers to various cities in the diaspora, people often hear this this canar, this story that. Gulbenkian supposedly planned to give all his money to the Armenian state, but changed his mind when they refused to name the road from Yerevan to the airport after him, um, and that he somehow went into a big strop as a result of that and, and crossed out the Republic of Armenia out of his will, disowning, as it were, the whole, the whole state, which otherwise would have been, could have really used the money. Gulbenkian was remarkably unvain. I mean, Nubar certainly was very vain, but Kalus was, was remarkably unvain. He was not someone who sought the public eye. He used to go around wearing clothes that were decent. He wasn't wearing dirty clothes, but he could walk in and out of the Ritz past lines of paparazzi and not be recognized. There's a wonderful story of him walking into the Ritz in Paris, probably through the back door. He always tried to avoid the attention. And there are paparazzi waiting. And he says, why don't you take a picture of me? And the paparazzi look at him and say, why would we do that? You're a nobody. And you know, little did they know that this was the man they were, they were there to catch was Gulbenkian. But because he wasn't dressing like a multimillionaire, um, he snuck past them. So, so there was no, no, no evidence that he intended to leave all his money to Armenia. And his general view of uh, repatriation was that Armenians, it would be best, and this is difficult, I think difficult for me to write about and difficult, I think, for some Armenians today to hear, he did not want Armenians to continue dreaming about going back to the old villages and the old um, towns back in Anatolia. He felt that was a distraction and that they should move away to America, Australia, South Africa, and start afresh, places where they would not be, as it were, always looking over their shoulder at the old, at the old home. Um, and I think that's very revealing. He was someone who always, who always, always looked forward. Thank you. And then uh, Marjorie uh, has a question. She says, why did he divorce his first wife, the Armenian wife? Uh, he did not. He, he was only married once. He, uh, the, the pair, Navart and, uh, Navart and uh, his uncle Benkian's wife, and they, 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 they almost get divorced just before World War I because they're having a real crisis in their relationship. Um, Gulbenkian sort of squiring various um, gaiety girls and actresses around London and, and Navarre doesn't like that, uh, understandably. But uh, he, they remained devoted, uh, as it were, devoted. It wasn't, it was a, not, I mean, they had two children. They, they were married for 50 years. She, his wife predeceases him. But uh, no, they, they were, he's only married once. Here you might, there might be the question that might be confusing him with his son. Nubar has three wives. Um, not, none of whom are Armenian. So, um, yeah, uh, Gulbenkian, Kalus Gulbenkian has brothers um, who marry Armenians and who, one of whom divorces them, but Gulbenkian um, stays married to her um, throughout, throughout his life. Any other questions? What was his relations with his brothers? Oh, that's another one. This is the wonderful thing. When I was starting to write the, the book, I was terrified. I was coming to this book as someone who writes on British, British history. I write about 18th century people like Adam Smith and 19th century stuff like the history of London. And when I um, got this sort of commission or sorted about, thought about writing this history, I thought it's going to be really hard writing about Gulbenkian. He, doesn't, he didn't seek attention. He never gave interviews. He was always hiding. And it's just going to be a really dull book because it's going to be one oil deal after another, which will only be interested to business, business men and women, uh, only in the oil sector. It was a real gift, although I think also very sad. And, and I spent five years working on the book. I, I, it came to, there were times when, I, when it would actually make me quite upset um, how difficult the family relations were, especially um, there's a long period where his daughter Rita is banned by Kalus from any contact with her own son because Kalus considers her to have gone off the rails 
she has it worth has a phase where she kind of is doing a lot of drinking a lot of drugs and for five and then world war ii happens so for five years which are very important five years in the little boy in mikhail's life he does not see his mother um so that was very and 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 she doesn't see him so anyway the, the, there are three brothers um Kalust is the eldest and so he's pushing around the two younger ones um next one karnik and vahan and they are all intended when their father dies relatively young in 1894 the idea is that they're going to continue running their father's import export business and Kalust within a few years gets bored of that and decides to move into into mining and later um, share um, oil share promotion um, as it were pumping shares and placing them in, in internet in in initial public offerings on stock markets um, so he drifts away and the and his brothers basically aren't very good at business and run the family business into the ground and he allows in 1907 he allows the the company that bears his own father's name to go bankrupt which is a source of profound shame and disgrace to the family and after that the brothers never quite can look at him the same way because in 1907 Gulbenkian is very wealthy he could have saved the family firm um, when when it goes bust in, in Istanbul in 1907 you know Byzantion the Armenian language newspapers there um, are puzzled you know surely surely Kalus Bey uh, or surely Baron Kalust will save his brother surely they will not allow the great firm of of Sarkis Gulbenkian uh, frère, oh sorry, Sarkis Gulbenkian fils, to go bankrupt. But he says, well, I did my best and I'm not going to keep throwing money at my brothers who aren't making any money. So for the rest of their lives, Karnik and Vahan are given a, an allowance by a monthly allowance by their brother. They almost, they do see him a few times, but not very often. And if they need to write to him, they write to his secretary, which is pretty demeaning. Mm, so yeah. yeah but for me as a biographer this was a gift because in each chapter i was able to do a bit of business you know maybe a bit about the art collecting or a bit about the birds and then i was able to always have a juicy bit of i feel bad mr gulbenkin would not like me calling it juicy um mm -hmm. i would have an involved bit of family history to deal with there's a question also on uh, the Kalus Gulbenkian Scholarship Fund, which I guess has helped quite a few students like me and Vahe and several others. So is it still ongoing and how many percent of Kalus Gulbenkian's money is it being allocated? Um, this is where it would be great if um, the other Panosian Razmik, Baron yeah. Razmik were here because I'm always, this happens a lot as you'd expect, and I'm always nervous speaking for the foundation because I don't work for them. But um, originally, when it's set up in 1950, 1956, the foundation is spending about 15 to 20% of its income, of its, of its, of its gift giving, of its, of its expenditure on charitable ends is going to the Armenian Communities Department. Since then, that's gone down um, since from 15%. Uh, but I, what the percentage is now, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's less than that. I know that um, Razmik has worked very hard since his appointment as, as director of the Armenian Communities Department to spend a lot of time listening. He spent the first few years really listening to the Armenian community all over the world and learning, learning about them and what the priorities are. And I think he's done wonderful work. Um, so yes, there are still individual uh, grants, but I think the focus, again, there'll be full information on the excellent uh, Armenian Communities website, uh, but I know they're doing a lot of work on producing teaching materials so that Armenian schools can have modern uh, teaching materials to teach, um, to teach Armenian in primary and secondary schools in America or, or elsewhere. Thank you. Suren Israelian is asking, which of the deals that he made you would consider as the most important deal? Wow. Um, 